God on this Reformation Sunday um, to celebrate the goodness of our Lord. We welcome all of you um, who are guests here this morning, so please um, sign one of our welcome cards. They're located right in front of you so we can stay in contact with you. And we welcome everyone who joins us via television and YouTube to uh, worship with us this morning. We're glad that you are here. This morning, as I said, we'll be celebrating the reformational uh, promise, and one of the footstools of the Reformation is that we share in the priesthood of all believers, meaning that there's no difference between the people and the priests or any stands um, within the church. We are all priests. We are all teachers to each other. And um, in that context, we'll be hearing from the Confirmation students their thoughts on their faith and how they journeyed to this particular portion in their life. So we'll be looking forward to hearing on that. At this time, I invite you to please stand as the people of God um, and join me on page number five in your blue books. Page number five on your, in your blue books for the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the creator of wind and rain, field and ocean, the bread of life coming down from above, the power at work within us and in this world. Amen. Before God and in the company of our sisters and brothers, let us confess our sin. Let's take a moment for silent confessions. God of glory and God of peace, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have thought better of ourselves than others. We have told lies, said hurtful things, acted in ways we wish we could take back, and looked the other way when action was needed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us, cleanse us, and heal us for the sake of Jesus our Savior. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. In Christ, you are a new creation. Your sins are taken away and you are made new. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Go and share God's peace with God's people.
Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated and Aaliyah to come forward. Eliah, I'll be learning it. Eliah, to come forward. Join me on page number 227 in the red book, actually, 227 in the front. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized into the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Now I invite the sponsors. There's a line on top of page 228. I'd like you to um, insert her name as you present her for baptism. Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have her baptized into Christ? Then as parents, Heidi and Jake, I invite you to respond with, I do. Now, as you bring Eliah to receive the gift of baptism, you entrust it with an invitation that God extends to you. And this is how the invitation reads. To live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, to nurture her in faith and prayer, so that Eliah may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Now, Heidi and Jake, do you promise to help her grow in the Christian faith and life, then please answer with, I do. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture Eliah in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit, to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church, then please answer with, I do. People of God, out here, you, the congregation, do you promise to support Eliah and pray for her and her life in Christ? Then please answer loud and bold and clear with, we do. We do. And we do hold them accountable. I ask you, all of you, but first I ask of you as the baptismal party three questions. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus to reject sin and confess the faith of the church. And here are the three questions for you. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Then please answer with, I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Then please answer with, I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Then please answer with, I renounce them. People of God, please rise. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father. 
Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I invite you to be seated. Now, if you want to hold Elia, that will be great. But we're not quite ready, so hold her comfortably. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit by the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection. You set us free from the power of sin and death and raised us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let me step around. Try not to be in front of anybody. No, that was kind of not really working out. But. Elijah, I baptize you in the name of the Father. Sorry, I have to be in front of the picture and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, three in one. She likes this so far. There we go. You may pick her back up. Just hold her for a little bit. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through the water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Elia with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Yeah, you can hold that. Elia, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. you hold that. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will have the light of life. Let us all welcome Elia, the newly baptized, into our family. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Now, we do have a few gifts. Some are more exciting than others. There's a baptismal medallion, Heidi, um, that you can engrave with the baptismal. It's a shell, and you can engrave with the date and whatever else you like on there. And there is the receiving blanket um, that was done by Carol Mackey and is to be just like the blanket she has right now, symbolizing that God's loving arms are wrapped around her forever and ever and ever. And we hope you will enjoy this gift. Since she has one, and we don't want to make her warmer than she already is, I'll let you hold on to that. And then there are those beautiful certificates that will always be with anything that we do. So I'll let you all hold on to them and sort them out as you wish. Now, I get the pleasure to carry her around, and you have the pleasure to have the offering plate passes you. So think I got the greater joy. Thank you, and you may be seated.
Our reading for this morning is taken from the second letter to Timothy, the first chapter. Paul writes, I'm grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The word of the Lord. At this time, we have the Covenant Choir that will bring praises to us at this time. reading of the Holy Gospel. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated as we join our voices to sing Jesus Loves Me and the children are invited to come up front. 
Jesus loves me. Oh, look who's coming. All right, I have a question for all of you. Well, what's my question? That's right. Who is that person? Martin Luther. No, nope, not King Jr. Martin Luther. There are a few differences between Martin King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. and this Martin Luther. Let's just name one. This Martin Luther. So what's different between the two of them? Who knows? Very good. Let's just leave it with that for now. He was German. So what language did he speak? Spanish? German, that's right. German. All right. Dann werde ich euch jetzt mal was auf Deutsch erzählen, damit ihr dann alle wisst, wie sich das anfühlt, wenn man in die Kirche geht und man nicht die Sprache verschrift, die dort gesprochen wird. That was German. That's right. So how did that feel? It was kind of weird. Well, it's not weird for me. That's right, because I know it. Now, my friend Martin Luther, when he went to church, what language do you think they spoke? In the church. In the church. Oh, oh, which one? Yes. What language do you think they spoke? Outside the church, they spoke German. That's right. What did they speak during worship? No? No? Latin. Now, do you think the people really liked it when they came to church and they couldn't hear, uh, couldn't, they could hear, but they couldn't understand? Do you think they liked it? No, they did not like it. So my friend Martin did something amazing. He said, when people go to church, they should actually understand what the pastor is saying. And they should actually understand the words when they sing. Just imagine how much more fun it is to actually hear and understand your words instead of me singing to you in German and then you're looking at me like, oh, I hope this is over soon because I don't understand a word. So we still, when, for example, when the church, when Trinity was founded, when it first became a church, people came from overseas and they brought their language with and they spoke that language in church. So which language do you think they spoke when Trinity first was founded? English? You almost got it, but not really. No, not Spanish. Where did most of the people come from that founded Trinity? What do you think? No, not American. Not English, if that's what you're thinking. Not German. Not Latin either. Well, what language do you think they spoke? Yeah, they know. But they haven't been there, so they're not that old. They just know because somebody told them. No? You think they were there? How many of you can still speak Norwegian? Well, there we go. Oh, there, there somebody is saying, just a little bit maybe. So do you think it was, would be helpful if we still worship in Norwegian? Because how many people would really understand Norwegian? Maybe two or three, right? So at one point, because the Lutheran Church always believes that we need to speak the language of the people, well now what language do we worship in? American English, you got it. You got it. With a term accent. 
Some of us worship an American English with a German accent, to be very specific about that. There are just a few of us. So it is very important that we always try to speak each other's language. That's why I believe children's sermons are very important. Because do you always understand adult language? Adult speak? No. No, you like to be spoken with and spoken to in the words that you understand. And that's why we have a children's sermon, because we believe as Lutherans that we need to speak each other's language. And your language seems to be a little different sometimes than adult language. And right now, Emma's language is, I'm done with this, be over with, mother. <laughs> so keep that in mind. When you meet someone, try to speak their language. Try to use words that they understand to tell them about God. That's the most important thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to speak our language, for speaking our language to us so that we understand that you love us. And so make us those instruments that speak the language of love so that people understand that you are a God of love that will embrace us, that will forgive our sins, and that will give us a new life. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Testing. God's grace and peace to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today um, is Reformation Sunday and Confirmation Sunday. And like always, or like often, we would like to share with you what our Confirmation students came up with. Um, each year, they have to write a statement of faith. And um, it is in that context that they have to answer quite a few questions. Questions like, where have I been on my journey of faith? Or where will I go from here? We decided to share with you some of those answers because like every year, our confirmation students did a great, great job. And I think it gives you a little glimpse um, what they learned and where they are in a spiritual sense. <clears throat> I will only read the first names um, because you can find the last name in the bulletin. So the first question is, how did I get here? And we're talking about the people who helped them to grow in, into their faith. How did I get here? Alex wrote, I remember waking, waking up on a warm Sunday morning and getting dressed in my summer play around clothes. I was all excited to go and play with my friends. Right when I was going outside, my mother said, no. You can't go right now. You know the rules. First, no, church first. Church first. From that point on, every Sunday morning, instead of playing with my friends right away, I got ready for church. End of quote. <clears throat> Dear friends, you can see that most of our confirmation students are here because their parents or grandparents made them go to church. 
they actually forced them, forced them to go. Brady is an other example of that. He wrote, I was one of those kids that didn't ever want to go to church as a child. Looking back, I'm so glad that my parents pushed me to go to church. It really helped to shape me into the person I am and the person I am going to be. End of quote. The next testimony is a testimony of a student who started her journey of faith when she was a little bit older. Um, Caitlin was about nine years old when she started to go to church. And I think Caitlin can serve us as, as a reminder that the church has to do everything in its power to welcome all people and to include all people, especially those who are not so familiar with our faith practices. Here's what Caitlin wrote. I started my faith journey when I was about nine. That was the first time I have ever been taught about Jesus and God. I was kind of lost at first because I didn't know anything about Jesus or God. Everybody was talking about Jesus and everybody knew what was going on. And I was lost. After a couple of times going to Sunday school, I started to ask questions. And that helped a lot. End of quote. You often heard me saying that it takes a village to raise a child or to get our children to a good start. And that's especially true when it comes to our faith. Lucas wrote, and he's talking about all those people who helped him to learn more about Jesus and to learn more about God. Lucas wrote, the people I have learned the most are my parents, my pastors, my youth directors, and last but not least, my Sunday school teachers. They are those people who I can sit down with. They will explain the verses to me that we read out of the Bible together. The person I thought that explained them the best are Dan Lemmy, I think he is here, and the pastors. Dear friends, the, the following statements, I'm just wondering, do you still hear me? Or should I switch? You still hear me? The following statements give you a little glimpse what our confirmation students actually learned in the context of our confirmation program. Brandon wrote, thank you so much. I think that's great. <laughs> I have learned this year that I need to always remember to keep God with me to keep God with me. I also need to remember that God is always with me. It doesn't matter how bad I screwed up, God will always be there for me. I also learned that I need to follow and live by the Ten Commandments. Mason learned 
quote, that's another student, Mason wrote, I learned that God loves us despite of our sins. He gives us forgiveness. Without God, there is no forgiveness. He is the source of all things. All things come from God. He is outstanding and almighty. God's word is everlasting. It inspires us and spiritually feeds us. He's talking about God's word. And most important, Jesus is the human form of God. He's the Alpha and Omega, the shining light and the Lamb of God who sacrifices himself for our sins, was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. And he is finishing saying, Jesus acted as God would. You know, I think it's really, it's pretty deep what those kids come up with. And I think we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish when they know that if you look at Jesus, you encounter God himself. You, know, you, you can experience God's love in many ways. But the real thing, the most, the purest way is when you look at Jesus, how he lived his life, how he related to others. Shayla wrote, um, the most important thing I have learned would have to be to give back, to give back to others. When we would serve meals on wheels, it would always be so much fun seeing the smiles on their faces and getting big hugs from people. Um, that's an important element of our confirmation program. They have to do um, quite a few service projects, like uh, delivering meals on wheels. And if you ask the kids, uh, the, the teenagers, I shouldn't say kids, um, that's probably one of their favorite things to do. Macy wrote, I have learned a lot over the years. I learned that Jesus is the Son of God. I have learned that I am a child of God and that he loves me very much. I learned that he died on the cross for us and the forgiveness of sins. I have learned the Ten Commandments and why they are there. They are here to protect us, to protect us and keep us close with our families and neighbors. Dear friends, after getting confirmed, right, the question always is, where will our students go from here? Or how are they going to apply what they actually learned in their daily lives. Here's some, something that they wrote. Kirsten wrote, one way I can work with Jesus to help others is to teach people about the Bible. I also want to help people that don't have anything and make it so that they have something. I also would like to go somewhere like Africa or Haiti and build shelters for the people in need. I'm looking forward to my future for helping people in need. Interesting to me is when you talk to our young students, they seem to have a real desire to make a difference in other people's lives, in Christ's name. That's why I think mission trips in our high schoolers go on mission trips on a regular basis are so important. Um, because you come home and you think that you accomplished something, but most important, you learn so much more 
about yourself and um, from those people you are supposed to help. Um, it's one of those times when you encounter Christ um, on a very deep level. Kennedy wrote, my mission will be to continue to help others with not only faith, but just simple things. Things as in helping someone, again, he is helping, in helping someone put their groceries in their car or something like that. I will be able to ful fulfill this because there's a need. And um, this is what I have learned would be the right thing to do. I could continue and continue. Um, if you would come today to the last, uh, uh, this afternoon to the confirmation worship, you could listen to all the um, students' testimonies. But I'm seeing that we are running out of time. But one thing that I found interesting is, um, this was probably, in my opinion, one of the worst classes ever because Pastor Dirk messed up big time. He started to change everything. And so for the first six months or four months at least or five months, we didn't get it right. And so I thought that we lost them, right? I mean, we really, I, I messed up big time. But anyhow, <laughs> that was a class where we had at least three people, three young students who consider full-time ministry as an option, as a true possibility. And I think the only reason why that's going to happen is because they were raised in a congregation like Trinity where they um, got introduced um, into the faith, into, into our Christian faith. And in that sense, I'd like to thank all of you, the choir directors, um, the guides, the confirmation teachers, the pastors, uh, my, 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 my co-pastors, the milestone people, Sandy Rohde, all those people um, for doing such a good job. So thank you. May God bless us and be with us always. Amen. Let us stand together and sing number 121 out of the blue book. 121 out of the blue book.
Andy Rohde to come forward um, for the milestone presentation for the seventh graders. Good morning. As she said, we're honoring our seventh graders today and they will receive a locker mirror which has the um, insignia Imago Dei, which means created in the image of God. We hope that the mirrors will help remind the students that there is something in each of us that reflects God's presence in their lives. As I call the students, I would like their parents to come up to be a part of the blessing. Jackson Bolt, Colby Briggs, Allison Bruns, Ethan Buxness, Alexis Drew, Riley Hall, Gabriel Yonke, Canyon Jansen, Marissa Jenks, Ty Jorgensen, Kennedy Kern, Casey Meadows, Drew Moore, Sam Olson, Riley Ruhrink, Mackenzie Ryan, Ali Saar, McKenna Schultz, Rebecca Sims, Braden Uwelling, Emily Van Leer, and Blake Whitethorn. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have created us in your image and that we reflect your beauty, each and every one of us in our very unique way. We ask that you remind us of this daily, every moment of our lives, and that we are to remind others of this very truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please rise for the prayers of the church. Made alive with God and Christ, we pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Reforming God, renew the covenant you have made with your people. Write your law on our hearts so that all we say and do proclaims the grace you have shown to us. Lord, in your mercy, revive those who live under the weight of anxiety, despair, or illness, or do not know or feel that they are created in your beautiful image. Carry their burdens and uplift them by your compassionate spirit. Lord, in your mercy, redeem your church from self-serving sins. Turn our hearts to people outside our walls and transform our community into places where we speak each other's language, where all may find redemption and hope. Lord, in your mercy, Gather these concerns and all who are in need into your abundant care, O God, remembering your promise of mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. The same after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us now pray how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Please know that everyone is welcome at the Lord's table if you believe in the forgiveness of sin and the renewal of life through this gift of grace.